My name is Ann Purvis and I'm one of the leaders of the Toronto Field Naturalist Junior Naturalist Program. We have been gathering every Wednesday at 4.30 for a one hour nature class this fall. This will continue until December 10th and anyone who is interested is welcome to join us. Each week we encourage members to submit pictures from walks they have been on in nature, uh, interesting things that they have seen, or of nature art that they have done during the week, either in their journal or in some other capacity. So these two pictures were submitted by Alexi and Sienna. Leaf collages, um, really cute creatures they created out of sumac and mulberry and tulip tree leaves um, with really adorable expressions on the faces of the creatures. Sandra also created um, these collages where she used other things besides leaves. In fact, they're mainly um, flower petals and needles and seeds and uh, demonstrating to us that other kinds of items from nature can be used for collages as well. This is a um, leaf collage done by myself. My, our beloved family cat passed away last Tuesday right before the class and um, it was very cathartic for me to create a collage of my cat sitting up like this on his haunches which is the way he used to sit in our living room in the easy chair that my husband used to sit and read the paper or read a book. And Wilksy would imitate him. This is a hermit thrush uh, photo submitted by Marina and Sonia and Mila. And our question to the group today was, do you know what common bird is a close relative of the hermit thrush? It took us a couple of minutes, a couple of guesses, um, but when we thought about the posture and the beak, um, we recognized that this hermit thrush is related to the American robin. So the hermit thrush is an insect eater during the summer, but will convert to eating berries in the fall, uh, berry diet in winter. One winter we actually saw a hermit thrush in Morningside Park eating berries. Normally though, they migrate to the U.S. So this bird would be on migration to the United States. Marina and Sonia also sent in two pictures of songbirds who may be with us all year round. Our group correctly guessed the black-capped chickadee and the downy woodpecker. Chickadees are very tame in Toronto, so it's a good time of year to start carrying seed with us when we go for a walk. Um, and when you hold it out in your hand, they will come and feed directly from your hand. So this is a garter snake. Uh, garter snakes mate in the fall or the spring. They hibernate in large groups of up to a thousand snakes. A single female will give birth to up to 30 live young in the middle of summer. And they are around us in the city. They eat mice and earthworms in urban settings and can live in old foundations of old buildings. I found this wasp nest in Hyde Park. I was surprised because I hadn't seen a nest with brown stripes like this. Paper is made out of wood. Uh, a wasp will scrape bare wood and then chew it until it is a pulp of fibers. This is exactly the same way that we make paper. We grind down wood and then mix it until it is a pulp and then spread it out very thin. So I was questioning where did this very cinnamon brown color come from and then I noticed these fence posts here and it was clear that the scratchings of the wasp are visible on the fence posts and they were getting this picking up some of the color of the fence post and that was ending up in their nest. This is a late season agapostum on foraging. I challenged the group if they could remember whether this was male or female. The female is actually all green, and the male just has the thorax and the head green. This bee um, is not a social bee in the sense of specializing with a, with a queen and workers who do all the foraging. However, they do live condominium style. So several bees, agapostum on females, will use a common opening they will each have their own burrow inside the opening. And this bee was designated the Bee of Toronto because of this interesting lifestyle. 
So I challenged the group if anyone remembered what caterpillar this is. Several people did. This is the gypsy moth caterpillar. We went over the life cycle of this caterpillar earlier and during the winter we see the egg masses on the trees. So Amara and Pamela submitted pictures of some fall plants. So this is, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure this is a bramble or a raspberry, wild raspberry. Um, it's a sun-loving plant that we usually find in meadow areas and we can see that it's, it's very uh, prickly and stiff uh, but turning brilliant colors. The plant in the middle is common mullein. It has a tall yellow candle in summer which becomes a brown spear in winter. Our kids used to use them for sword fights. This one is a first year plant. It takes a year for the plant to get established before it makes the candle. These are field flowers. People all over the world have used mullein leaves and flowers as a painkiller to help with chest colds, to help with getting to sleep. There are about eight different uses for this plant. It is also quite common and pops up in gardens. And finally, these are some puff balls that I, I found when I first found them. I thought they were stumps that somebody had cut off uh, the branches from. Um, then when I picked it up and um, pressed it, um, spores puffed out from the beginning, so I knew what they were. You can see that the upper surface has sort of cracked as the thing grew. So this week we are featuring um, oak trees and acorns this week and next week. And we're going to talk this week about a very special habitat that is found in High Park called the Black Oak Savanna. So oak trees love High Park. It has deep sandy soil that was laid down on the bottom of Lake Ontario 12,000 years ago. At that time, Lake Ontario was called Lake Iroquois and it covered a much bigger area including High Park. Oak trees can flourish in sandy soil because they have a deep tap root, a root that looks like a carrot. That root can go very deep in the ground in search of water. Oak trees are wonderful for insects. Over 500 species of butterflies and moths eat the leaves and we have seen how many different kinds of gall making insects use the leaves. Lots of creatures can nest in cavities in the wood. High Park Nature website has lots of pictures of the moths and caterpillars that use oak leaves and I recommend that you go to the link which is below the slideshow on the uh, on the blog post. Here are, here's the, uh, the tracks of a leaf miner, probably made by uh, a Neptaculidae moth, which are the tiniest moths on earth. They can, the adults are less than three millimeters long. Um, this, these are galls, uh, probably made by a cinnipid wasp, as we found out earlier. And this is a white marked tussock moth. So it represents the 500 hymenopterans that use, or lepidopterans, I'm sorry, that use um, oak leaves as food. Here is a picture of what the oaks in High Park looked like in 1993. We had a discussion in our group about why, what's wrong with this picture. Why is this not good habitat for wildlife? Many people notice that there's, there's no cover for wildlife, there's no understory, uh, there's nothing but the oaks and then this turf grass. So many of the lepidopterans, the butterflies and moths might be able to survive in the canopy. There might be birds that could survive in the canopy, but as far as mammals, amphibians, reptiles, there couldn't really be anything that could survive in this very, very open landscape. Another problem with this scenario uh, for nature lovers was to realize that all of these oak trees were roughly the same age and they were all going to look like this someday. Because the lawn was being mowed, no sapling oaks were coming up to replace the oaks that were getting older and older. So in 2002, the City of Toronto and the High Park Stewards launched a program to fix this ecosystem, to turn it back into traditional black oak savanna. And this is what large parts of the park look like now. There's an oak tree in the background. The oak trees are surrounded by very tall grasses, native grasses, and beautiful wildflowers like this. 
some of these grasses that are native um, to Ontario can grow up to five feet tall. This was, a, this was a habitat or an ecosystem that was very valued by native people. They wanted to keep these meadows open in order and stop other species from growing in and take other woody species from growing in and taking over because they wanted to grow one of these tall grasses, Indian grass, to lure the deer out onto the meadow who would then feed on it. They also wanted the open space to grow the three sisters, uh, corn, squash, and beans. But how were native people to keep these meadows open and keep them from filling in with unwanted species? They did this by burning the meadow every so often. Oak trees can withstand burning because of very thick bark and a deep root. And actually even sapling oak trees are able to resist burning. The City of Toronto now does the same thing, which they have learned from Native people. Every few years they burn the oak savanna of High Park in order to keep the oak savanna as a savanna.